All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks to all for joining us today for the Center for Clean Water Technologies monthly seminar series. Um, it's a great pressure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jamie J Meliker. Dr. Meliker is a professor of public health and family population and preventative, uh, preventive medicine at Stony Brook University. His research contributes to the fields of exposure science and environmental epidemiology. His scholarship falls into two lines of inquiry. Uh, identifying environmental factors that play important roles in disease morbidity, and two, developing methods that improve our ability to investigate exposure disease relationships. He served as an elected counselor for, uh, of the International Society of Exposure Science. He's a member of the NIH, NIH IRAP review panel and a member of the editorial boards of several reputed international scientific journals. With that, Jamie, thanks for um, agreeing to give a talk in our seminar series, and please go ahead with your talk. Thanks, Arjun. All right, so this is an epidemiologic talk to show a bit about, you know, I guess environmental epi and what we do. That being said, some parts might be complicated to some people. So I really, I really would like it if you interrupt me as we go, if things are confusing, because I'd like to make sure that, you know, you're understanding what we're doing. So please do. I know the chat button works, but it's always hard to see chats when you're sharing your screen. So if you interrupt, I think it'll be better. But if you chat, maybe somebody else will interrupt for you <laughs> if you post something in the chat. I'll keep track of chat questions, Jamie. Okay. So this is a study that we did some time ago, actually. It was, uh, you know, the study we recruited individuals between 2003 and 2007. This is a study of arsenic in drinking water in southeastern Michigan. So you get a nice picture of the thumb region of Michigan there where the study was conducted. And we studied bladder cancer. And it's called a case control study, which means cases have bladder cancer, controls do not. And we're comparing their exposure histories. So we're looking for whether or not cases with bladder cancer have different or higher levels of exposure in their history compared with controls. So I'll show you a little bit about this study, describe the motivation, our exposure assessment, and our epidemiologic analysis. And then I'm really using this as a segue into what we're proposing to do in our environmental cancer cohort on Long Island, which is still only in the proposal stage. Um, we don't know yet the result of the NIH review. So these, these data are, are dated, right? But it's still, bladder cancer is still one of, you know, the top five or six most common cancers diagnosed. And that means, you know, somewhere between 60 and 80,000 new cases each year somewhere around 15,000 deaths each year from bladder cancer. So not a lot when you think about it as, you know, overall, you know, how many people there are in the country, but it's still the fifth or sixth most common cancer diagnosed. So it really lets you know how rare cancer is from a, you know, if we're talking about yearly diagnoses, there just aren't very many. Established risk factors are older white men tend to get higher rates of bladder cancer, which in, to some extent is linked to their historical exposures, both their historical smoking as well as their historical occupational exposures in industry. Specifically, aromatic amines have been strongly linked with bladder cancer, but lots of industrial exposures have been linked. And what's important is that many cases remain unexplained after, even after accounting for what we know to be established risk factors. So we're looking at additional potential risk factors and arsenic is one of them. And ecologic studies, so within the epidemiologic field, ecologic studies are group level comparisons. So those are studies that show in regions with high levels of arsenic as on average, those regions also have higher rates of bladder cancer. So long as those concentrations are above 170 micrograms per liter, we really don't know much about concentrations below 100. We're, we, we know more now, but at the time that we were doing this, we really didn't know much. And we decided to study this in Michigan because Michigan has you know, elevated arsenic in the drinking water. You would be driving down the highway in Michigan, 
and there would be an ad for getting your water tested for arsenic on the highway. So it was something that was well known. Here's a report of uh, two schools. This is just outside of Detroit. Uh, Orion is in Oakland County, one of the wealthier counties in the country, um, just outside of Detroit. And they had high levels of arsenic in their drinking water. So they had to bring in bottled water. And you can see we were estimating somewhere around 235,000 people in this 11 county region were exposed to arsenic above 10 micrograms per liter, which was the new guideline that went into effect in 2006. So that's a, you know, it's a decent number of people there. Now, for those of you who have studied this or have thought about this at all, this was quite contentious, right? One of the last things that Bill Clinton did was he said, we're gonna reduce the level of arsenic in our public drinking water, the MCL, from 50 to 10 micrograms per liter. And this came through even though, and this is from the National Research County Subcommittee on Arsenic and Drinking Water. I'm quoting here, no human studies of sufficient statistical power or scope had examined whether consumption of arsenic and drinking water at what was then 50 micrograms per liter results in an increased incidence of cancer or non-cancer effects. So it was very uncertain. These were all based on models. Another quote, additional epidemiologic evaluations are needed to characterize the dose response relationship for arsenic associated cancer and non cancer endpoints, especially at low doses. So it was quite contentious. Um, furthermore, um, we don't have animal models. So we don't have acceptable animal models for studying arsenic carcinogenicity. I think we're doing a little better now, but still not great. So epidemiologic studies were really driving this. They were some of the best data that we had for guiding our risk assessment. And there was a great need for studies that employ careful approaches to exposure assessment. So one of the first things Bush did when he came into office you know, in early 2001 was he said, hold on, let's review. Should we drop the level from 50 to 10? And there was another subcommittee that published another report and said, okay, we'll drop it from 50 to 10. So it still went into effect in 2006, but it was very contentious. EPA gave you know, a fair bit of money to different public municipalities to treat their water to get the levels down from 50 to 10. And definitely some municipalities had to shift their source of water. They had to start buying water from somewhere else because it was just levels were too high. So, so that's, that's the background, right? The framing of, of what was going on at the time. And we were funded to study long-term, perhaps lifetime exposure to arsenic in relation to you know, bladder cancer. And there were lots of questions in terms of how to do a good exposure assessment in that type of study, right? Should we include arsenic in foods? or arsenic in water that's used to make foods like pasta or rice? Um, should we include arsenic in water at work? Is that an important source? Should we think about timing of exposure? Are we just thinking about overall lifetime exposure? Is it timing of exposure, meaning the exposure that you had when you were a child or perhaps when you were you know, pregnant Is it, or your mother was pregnant? Is it timing of exposure in that, you know, there's some latency between exposure and outcome that maybe the exposure, what really matters is what happened 20 years prior to diagnosis, not what happened in the last 20 years. So there are lots of questions about that. And then there's also questions about it's really hard to assess exposure, right? We can measure arsenic in your current residence, but it's really hard to estimate it in places that you used to live. And we also have to think about water consumption and whether or not we're quantifying that well. So there's, there were questions about whether to quantify the exposure misclassification as well and to propagate that through the model. So these were some of the things that we were thinking about at the time as ways of doing things better than what had been done. So this case control study, as I mentioned, cases have the disease, controls do not. Controls were selected really by population-based random digit dialing, as well as random digit dialing of age-weighted lists. And we made sure they were similar to cases on age, race, and sex, just so those factors weren't driving our association. Individuals had to live in one of the 11 counties that I showed you on that first slide for at least the previous five years, 
had no previous cancer, so that we're sure that we're focusing on bladder cancer here and not a secondary cancer. And they answered lots of questionnaires. They allowed us to come to their homes. We collected water, toenails, urine, and saliva samples. And you can see we ended up with more than 900 total participants in this case control study. So as I mentioned, cases come from the state. So these are from the state cancer registry. Um, for those of you who are interested in epidemiology, it is often hard to recruit cases because we don't have good registries in this country. So, you know, what's nice about cancer is we have cancer registries. So we were able to recruit cases directly from the cancer registry. We knew we had a list of just about every case in the state of Michigan and controls from some type of random digit dialing of different lists. And people provided us with a medical history, their water consumption patterns, lifestyle risk factors, family history of cancer, and dietary habits. So this is all self-report. They also self-reported. We mailed them residential and occupational history forms and a water supply history for each residence and occupation, as well as home water treatment history. So if they treated their water at home. And we had a brief food frequency questionnaire of just what they were eating and drinking the previous three days so that we could link it to urine, for example, which is an indicator of more recent exposure. So we had different biomarkers of toenails and urine. We were also collecting saliva for genetic analysis, and we measured arsenic in their home water supply. So that was, that's the scope of the study. So you get a, you get a sense. It's a, it's a lot to do. We're going to everyone's home to collect their water, toenails, saliva, and urine, as well as forms, and reviewing the forms with them, as well as a phone interview beforehand. Now, for the exposure assessment, this is where, right, we're, what we're trying to do is to assess you know, how much exposure they've had to arsenic. Now, easy, right? You say, okay, well, let's measure arsenic at their current residence. That makes sense. That's easy enough to do. So that we did. So we measured arsenic species in the urine and water um, on, and as mentioned, also collected toenails in urine. Um, historic public supply data. So that makes sense too, right? You say, okay, current residents, you have the arsenic. What about past residences that were on public supply in the study area? Do we have data for that? And it turned out we did. Uh, we, were, we worked closely with the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. They had samples, they had measurements from 1,675 um, different, different times and locations over a, a more than 20 year period. In addition, we contacted 135 public water suppliers in our study area. Because in this 11 county area, I showed you it was like 2.8 million people. There were 135 water suppliers that served at least 1,000 people. So we got information from them on how their water supply source changed, how their treatment processes changed, and how their geographic extent changed as best as they could tell us from 1920 to 2000. And for, you know, I think for most, they had, there was somebody who was there who knew, who knew the history. So maybe not going back to 1920, but, you know, there may not have been that many changes before 1920, at least, in, you know, going back to 1950 or so, maybe 1940 in some cases. And then we combined these data sets. So we had water supply histories with these public arsenic data, and we generated a mean, a median, and a standard deviation for arsenic at each public water supply at specific times, right? We generally assumed that arsenic in public well water was temporarily invariant, unless there was evidence to the contrary, like they shut down a well. If they told us they had shut down a well, then we had measures before they shut down a well and measures after they shut down a well. The other thing I want to point out is that just because the data started in 1983, they were measuring wells that may have been in use in the 1960s and 1970s. They were still measuring them in the 80s. And in general, we were assuming that arsenic in a particular well was stable. And there's pretty good evidence to suggest that's true. So if you measure arsenic in a well today, it was similar to what the arsenic level was in that well, say 20 years ago. So we had pretty good data to support that. And here's a schematic of 
our public water supply arsenic data for this thumb region of Michigan, where you can see different water suppliers popping up. They're coming online. Over time, you'll also see the colors change. Some, some of the darker blues get lighter as, as communities are trying to figure out what to do about the arsenic that was in their water. So this is a, a visualization. This is Oakland County here, and Detroit is just down here. So those are the past public water supplies. The other thing we had to estimate was arsenic in past private wells. And this was definitely the most difficult part of the study. We had pretty good data from the state, 6,050 measurements from unique private wells over a 10-year period. We built a geostatistical model of this data set. Uh, we have good data that it is temporally invariant. There's not a lot of change within a particular well. We had a validation data set. Our, uh, we had, we, what's nice about a geostatistical model is you get an estimate of the arsenic and an estimate of the variance associated you know, at each location. And we had to rely on spatial characteristics because for most locations, well construction characteristics weren't available. So we could build a model with the well characteristics. We had you know, maybe 500 or 700 wells where we knew the well characteristics, but we couldn't extend that. And there was, there's so much variability in Michigan that literally on the same property, you can have two wells that are drawing water from different aquifers and their arsenic concentration would be different. So here is our training data set of 6,050 arsenic measurements. You can see there are some dark colors here in the middle, as well as up in the tip of the thumb. And you can see that car captured in the, in the geostatistical model. But the other thing I want to highlight is that even in these high areas, there are a lot of low measurements as well. And that was what was hard, that we really, you know, you had a greater likelihood of having high arsenic in some of these areas, but Overall, um, there was a lot of noise in our ability to predict high arsenic. And you can see that here in our validation. We did better than if we had done something more simple, but you can see Pearson's R just correlating our prediction from our model with the measured arsenic concentration that we had. You can see it's not very good. So correlations around 0.5, a little better than everything than the other approaches, but still not great. So, so far we have arsenic at our current residence that we've measured. We have arsenic in public water supplies. Historically, we have arsenic estimated in past private wells. And then we're also linking all of that with the individual mobility histories. And we recorded all residents or occupations of at least one year. This was more than 8,800 residences that were reported for these more than 900 individuals. They provided us with information about their water supply, whether they were on private well or public water, any treatment that they used within the home. And we ended up with 99% of person years being reported for both cases and controls, which is really extraordinary. They really, they, they did a great job completing these forms. That's more than 64,000 person years that were covered. And here you get a visualization, cases are red, controls are blue. You'll see people moving through time. Some people are staying in the same location. Some people are moving into the study area. A lot of people started their life in Detroit and then slowly moved out into the study area. And you get a little visualization um, whether or not you saw any potential clustering. We actually did do some tests of clustering of these residential histories, and we didn't see any. Um, so we didn't see strong clustering in the areas where there is high, high levels of arsenic. Um, but clustering analyses are, you know, they're notoriously not as good. Um, just the methods ha have been problematic over time, especially through residential histories. It's a lot of false positives, just hard to test. I could talk about that if you have questions. Okay. From a technical standpoint, we have all these databases that we need to integrate. And we wanted to do this in an automated fashion because we might have a better model of arsenic in past private wells at some point. And it would be great if we did, 
we might have more detailed exposure metrics that I mentioned in the beginning. Maybe they account for inorganic arsenic in foods. So we wanted to automate this entire process. And we developed a software called Space Time Information System with an academic spin off in Ann Arbor called Biomedware. The software is managed by Terraseer, and STIS is their software. And you can see here, so here's an example. These are just two individuals I'm showing here, Prisman ID 2, Prisman ID 3. You get their residences, their residential history. So for one individual, they only have four residences, another they had two. And we're measuring arsenic at their current residence. And for past residences on public supplies, we're getting arsenic data from our public supply database. And remember, this is all being automated. And you can hopefully see here, for me, it's a little bit, some things are in the way, but we have estimates for arsenic in Bad Axe. We have estimates for arsenic in Montrose and how that changed in 1979 when the water supply changed. So the groundwater, they stopped using groundwater in 1979 and shifted to surface water. You might remember when you heard about the Flint water crisis, that Flint was getting its water from Detroit and then started getting its water from the Flint River. So that both are surface water in that case. But the point is these, these communities would periodically decide to just start to buy water from, and it was mainly from Detroit, that it was pumped in from Detroit. So that's what happened in 1979 in Montrose. So even though the individual didn't move, individuals in that location from 1940 to 83, their water supply needs to change, right? And their arsenic level has to change in the estimate that we give them. Now for the past private well, we estimate it from the geostatistical model. We have estimates there. And we get estimates then for arsenic concentration at each residence. And I'm just highlighting from 1979 to 83, we're getting an estimate for arsenic that reflects that their water supply changed. So this is all done in an automated fashion. And what you see here is a visualization of how the arsenic is being distributed across our cases and controls. You can see for current residents, it's somewhere around 26, 27% that we have data. We have measurements. So that's great. I mean, we're, we're measuring arsenic for 26 to 27% of their person years. So quite stable population. Past residences in the study area, we get another 23 plus 16, 22 plus 16, so, you know, pushing 48, 49% for past residences in the study area. And then we had pretty good estimates for Detroit public supply. So that's another 13% or so. So that gets us up to about 80% of person years being spent in Southeastern Michigan, where we, you know, we had done a fair bit of work. As I told you, I'm not as comfortable with the past residences on private wells, but overall we did a pretty good job there for other public supplies outside the study area and private wells outside the study area you can see here there were databases that were out there that we could use to try to generate estimates uh, for international we just assumed background 0 0.3 and some people didn't provide their residents as i said so that gives you some sense of of our population and pretty similar data for cases and controls. They both participated pretty evenly in terms of what they're telling us. Now, I told you that there could be other factors at play. And one thing that we did was we ran a Monte Carlo simulation analysis where we were looking at the ranges of possible exposure given what we were learning based on the food frequency questionnaires and the concentrations of the water at places other than home or work or concentrations at work. And what we saw is water at home and food intake were the two largest drivers. So that's what we were focusing on. So we were also thinking about food intake, especially you know, this was from rice largely, as well as water that's being used to make things like rice and pasta that seemed to be influencing this in our model. But then we also had these toenail and urine 
bio, biomarkers that we could validate our exposure metric with, with. And here I'm showing you the results for urine, but they were pretty similar for toenail. And what I can show you is that we have three intake metrics here. Intake metric one is simple. This is just arsenic concentration in the drinking water, micrograms per liter. Intake metric two is taking that concentration in the drinking water and multiplying it by the water intake. So liters per day, micrograms per liter times liters per day. Again, it's self-report of how much water you're intaking. This is for urine, so it's just the previous three days. We're just looking at how your intake over the previous three days relates to your urine arsenic levels. And you know, urine here is MMA plus DMA plus inorganic arsenic. So these are the more toxic forms of arsenic in our urine. Those of you who know this, total arsenic is a very bad met metric of exposure to the more toxic forms of arsenic. And then metric three factored in inorganic arsenic in foods. So again, um, grams per day or micrograms per day of inorganic arsenic in foods. And what I want to show you is that the R squared didn't increase. Oops, sorry. Whether we went from metric one to two to three across any of these different scenarios. So it didn't help us to factor in drinking water intake, which surprised us at first. We were like, well, that's weird because you would think drinking water intake at minimum would help. And there was a study that came out around the same time as we were doing this, which reported that people report their drinking water intake so poorly that when you include it in your metric, all it's doing is adding noise. It's not really helping. And what they suggested, this is, a, um, I know this guy's first name, but I'm blanking on it. He's at EPA, uh, his last name's right. He's at the Cincinnati EPA office. Um, what he suggested and what we then followed was he said, you should just stratify into high and low water intake and that that will give you better data. And it actually did seem to help. So the first thing we did was we looked at, okay, well, maybe there's just noise because the arsenic is so low. So let's limit it to those with at least one microgram per liter in the arsenic. And then the R squared did go up a bit. If we limited it to those greater than or equal to one microgram per liter who drank greater than the median amount of water, again, just based on self-report, the R squared went up a fair bit to 0 0.39. So that that looked like our best metric for what we should use in an epidemiologic study. So that's what we did here in the epi analysis. So as I mentioned, the question is how do we treat home water consumption? We can treat it continuously or categorically split at the median. We, were, we hypothesized that the median will be better given what we were seeing, but we still ran the analyses both ways to see what we saw. And then there was a paper that came out in 1995 that also hypothesized that since we're looking at bladder cancer, we're looking at carcinogens that are sitting in the bladder for a period of time. They hypothesized that maybe what we should be doing is also dividing the water consumption by total fluid consumption to account for possible dilution of the arsenic in the urine. So individuals who were consuming more water as a percentage of their total fluids they might be at greater risk than individuals who may be drinking more water overall, but as a percentage of their total fluids were actually lower because maybe they just drank lots of fluids. So to factor in this percentage of fluids that actually, actually come from water. So we're going to, I'll show you that coming up too. So as I mentioned, it is, a, bladder cancer is a disease of older white men, but we matched on age, race, and sex. And that's why you see here that there are no differences. So this is an odds ratio is what you're seeing. You get it from a logistic regression analysis. You can get an odds ratio. It's basically saying odds of exposure among the cases divided by odds of exposure among the controls. And if there is a greater odds, if it's greater than one, then there's elevated risk among that exposed group. And you can see here, the odds ratio is you know, pretty comparable to one across these, nothing statistically significant. We don't get any confidence intervals above one for age, race, or sex. So we matched okay. 
when we looked at cigarette smoking, as we know, cigarette smoking is associated with bladder cancer. And we see that here, former smokers greater than or equal to 20 years and current smokers greater than or equal to 20 years, we see increased risk. And similarly for education, we also see that if you're high school or less, you have greater risk than college graduates. So college graduates are more at half the risk of high school educated individuals. So here's the beginning of our results. What you see here is these are statistically adjusted odds ratios. There's very little difference between statistical adjustment and unadjusted. So I'm only showing you the statistically adjusted. We have the first, which is the arsenic concentration in the drinking water, micrograms per liter. The second here is arsenic in intake in micrograms per day. So this one multiplied through the drinking water intake. And really similar to what we hypothesized, you get lower risk when you multiply through the liters per day of fluid intake. It just adds noise to your model. So you can see our odds ratios get closer, closer to one in general, 1.03, 1.07 here. Whereas for the concentration in water, it's not statistically significant, but there was some hint of a suggestion that's, that's happening. Then when we stratified by home water consumption above one liter per day, we get a bit more of a suggestion per five microgram per liter increase. Odds ratio was 1.23, borderline significant, greater than 10 micrograms per liter. It's getting up there. Uh, it's not statistically significant. And you can see the sample size is getting small. And this happens, right? This is the problem with stratifying. Similarly, if we stratify by that above median percentage of fluids that contain water from home, in addition to the home water consumption above one liter per day, Again, we get an odds ratio that's borderline. This one goes up to 1.33, but our sample size is getting smaller. And for the greater than 10 microgram per liter category, we do reach statistical significance, but I wouldn't believe it with 13 cases and seven controls there, driving that with an odds ratio of 3.71. So then we're thinking, well, what about incorporating quantitative estimates of exposure misclassification, because we know there's some error in our exposure assessment. So instead of only using point values of exposure at each point in time, let's incorporate some of our noise and variability in that estimate of arsenic over the life course, because we already had estimates of variance and error that were generated in those different databases. We can draw so we can generate probabilities from those estimates of variance and error, draw exposure estimates from those probability distributions that are actually individual level and time varying. And then we can repeat this analysis of arsenic with bladder cancer, repeat the epidemiologic analysis 999 times. And in so doing, we're propagating the noise in the exposure estimate. So that's what we did here. This is in the arsenic per five microgram per liter increase with greater than one liter per day of home water consumption. This is the one that in the traditional analysis, we had an odds ratio of 1.23 with a borderline confidence interval that you know, went from one to 1.52. You can see here in these simulations, you know, there were some where the odds ratio was less than one. Most of the odds ratio was above one. The median was 1.08, so not very, high, less than the 1.23, and 19% of the simulations were statistically significant. So again, how do you interpret this when, when you're propagating the uncertainty? We would interpret it as there's some evidence that there might be increased risk, but it's noisy. We're not sure. We really like doing this. Um, this is not very common in epidemiologic studies to propagate your error through using that singular estimate is overly simplistic. It does not reflect the underlying misclassification in the exposure assessment, uh, whereas this resulting distribution of possible odds ratios does reflect that underlying exposure misclassification. And I think you know we're reasonably confident that somewhere the odds ratio is going to be somewhere in here. The problem is it's, it's broad. Some are below one, some are above one. Now, 
anytime you run an observational epidemiologic study, there's potential bias. Uh, recall bias is a particular problem in case control studies because cases often are more likely to recall things than controls because you're asking the case, well, do you remember drinking water? Um, do you remember, you know, and, and a case who has disease is, is just in general more likely to report that they do recall drinking more water or being potentially more exposed. Given that, we were pleasantly surprised to see that in our study, self-reports of water consumption history were actually higher for controls. Our controls drank a little more water than our cases. So we don't think recall bias among the cases is driving things here, you know, this hint of an association. Person years of residential mobility were equal for cases and controls, again, suggesting that you know, cases aren't participating more readily than controls. So we didn't think recall bias was a big problem. Selection bias, though, we're a little bit more concerned about. So it turned out that 22% of our potentially eligible cases died prior to contact. They died within that first year, and the cancer registry was, it took the cancer registry like 18 months to get us names. I can't fully explain why, there's just a lot of vetting that goes on to make sure they're real cases. Once we contacted them, only 35% of cases that we contacted agreed to participate. The participating cases generally were younger and had less invasive cancer. So these are, this is a more mild form of bladder cancer than those who didn't participate. So that's important, right? That our, our results are really only relevant to these younger cases with less invasive transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. Controls, so imagine for controls, what we're doing is we're, we hired a company to randomly call people. And we had, they, they had addresses on these individuals as well. And we would mail in a big, 10 by 13 envelope, you know, information about the study in advance of the phone call to try to facilitate greater participation. And I think that's why we ended up with 59% of those who we contacted actually were screened for eligibility. So they screened in, they didn't hang up immediately. I think 59% actually isn't horrible if you can think of all the time somebody calls you and how often you hang up. Um, but among those who were deemed eligible, only 27% agreed to participate. They were just like, it was just too much, right? Where they had to answer a 45 minute questionnaire. They had to set a time for us to come to their home. We provided water arsenic result tests to them, which is why we think in the end, we got greater participation from controls who were on private well water, 43% versus the general population in the study area, which was only 29% on private well. So that could bias our results toward the null because our controls, it turned out, weren't representative, fully representative of the general population. They were more representative of a population that's more likely to at least currently be exposed to higher arsenic. That doesn't mean their lifetime arsenic is necessarily higher, but their current private well, they were currently on private well, which is associated at least with higher arsenic levels. So what could we conclude from this? We can conclude that you know, categorical water consumption is, is a, a good way to think about dealing with water. I think there's pretty strong evidence now that suggests that's true rather than multiplying through self-reported liters per day. We definitely need additional power to confirm any hint of findings that we have. There have been other studies looking at arsenic and bladder cancer at these low levels. They also are wishy-washy. We're not seeing strong evidence across, across the literature. And there is potential for selection bias, which I, meant, which I mentioned. Um, there were methodological contributions. Right? This was one of the first studies that factored in space-time variability and mobility, activity patterns, and arsenic concentrations that used biomarkers of exposure and simulation analyses to help us develop an exposure metric. Um, and one of the first studies to propagate estimates of our individual level exposure misclassification into our epidemiologic analysis. And I haven't even talked about timing of exposure, which we also did, which I haven't shown today, but I do want to show you that we did look at this. 
So we were looking here, I'm showing age at exposure between age 18 and 17 and 70. We also looked at calendar year of exposure between like 1940 and 2000 and years prior to diagnosis or interview, anywhere from zero years to like 60 years prior to diagnosis and interview. We didn't see any associations with calendar year or years prior to diagnosis or interview. We did see associations with age in this range, you know, from like your mid 40s to your mid 50s. What you see here in the darker black is the greater than 10 microgram per liter group. This is again among those who consume greater than one liter per day of water from home, so above the median. We did see some increased risk here if we're looking at timing, but we don't know whether or not this is meaningful because there's so much false positive potential here because we're calculating an odds ratio for every year. So if we're showing here, you know, 50 years of data, and I just told you it's another 120 years of data across the other two, that's 170 years of data. So using a P of 0.05, just by chance, you would expect that there would be some region that is elevated, and that's what we see. So we weren't sure what to make of it. Um, but this is something that, you know, would be great if we could shed light on timing of exposure. So we tried. Okay, so I'm going to move into this uh, environmental cancer cohort on Long Island. What I want to tell you is that epidemiologic studies are hard. There is noise. And what we are generally looking for is a big signal. So we need a big signal that helps us overcome the noise. And we really didn't see that in our study. You know, you know, in Michigan. The other thing I want to tell you is that it's really hard to run these case control studies because controls so rarely participate. And for something like cancer, it's, it's one of the only strategies we have because cancer is so rare. So what the National Cancer Institute has done, because case control studies are so rarely funded now, because there's so much noise and there's so much problems in terms of selection bias of our controls, especially, National Cancer Institute with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences decided to put out a request for proposals for five or six cohorts, environmental cancer cohorts, where we could study environment in relation to cancer, but in a cohort. So we proposed recruiting 10,000 people. And I'll tell you about that in a, in a second. So this proposal is in Suffolk County. It's a cohort in Suffolk County that is currently under review at NIH. It was scored 33. It's a six-year grant with the likelihood of renewal if we meet our goals. I'm an MPI with Paolo Buffetta, but this is really Paolo. Paolo is the one who made this happen. Um, and there's drinking water contaminants that we're measuring or proposed to measure. Nitrates and chlorinated solvents are the main ones historically because we have good data here in Suffolk County on that. Um, PFAS and 1,4-dioxane we also want to measure, uh, but you know that'll be more data that starts today and goes forward. So as I mentioned, it's 10,000 long-term residents of Suffolk County, ages 50 and over. And we're gonna estimate lifetime exposure to these drinking water contaminants where possible. Like we said, at least we think nitrates and chlorinated solvents with follow-up for cancer incidents over time. In the six years, we won't have power for cancer. But you know, if we follow people for 12 years or 15 years or 20 years, we should have power for, can for some cancer outcomes. And, you know, we're looking at exploring for biomarkers of exposure and indications of carcinogenicity. So we're very interested in looking at the exposure to disease pathway. Like, how is exposure turning into cancer? So what is the pathway along, along that, which includes looking at DNA methylation, metabolomics, as well as genetic signatures in those cancers. So that's what we're proposing to do. Um, as I said, it was scored 33, which is a competitive score, um, but we don't know. We don't know if it's going to be funded. 
I think we're a little skeptical it's going to be funded. We think probably I serve on an NIH review panel for the general panels. Things scored in the 10s and 20s are funded. When you get into the 30s, it's more it's more borderline. That being said, I have had a 40 that was funded. When it's an RFA, you don't know what what the panel is going to score. Maybe the panel, you know, the panel scored like 20 or 30 grant proposals. Maybe they didn't score any above a 20. Maybe they only scored 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And the 33 might be one of the top five or six. Um, we also think there will be decisions made within the National Cancer Institute as to how these things are funded, right? They might not follow the score exactly. They might be like, well, we want to fund this one on water or the, the top score got water, so we're not going to fund any other waters. The second score might be on air, things like that, or they might, you know, we just don't know. There's also geographic areas. They often tend to fund things in different geographic areas to spread out the studies around the country. So that's that's a bit of a background on that cohort. And I just want to close by letting you know that there are some things I'm doing with drinking water contaminants on Long Island, but they're generally called ecologic studies, as I described earlier. They're just looking at group-wise comparisons, looking at areas with high levels of nitrates and seeing whether those areas have high rates of negative reproductive outcomes like premature babies or low birth weight. Uh, similarly, looking at areas of fluoridation. Uh, this uh, Dr. Choi came, came to me with this idea. He said he's seeing a lot of secondary bone cancer and he was wondering if the reason is because we don't fluoridate our water here. He was wondering if fluoridation might be predict, predict, protective for secondary bone cancer among cancer patients. And so we looked at that and we did not find evidence that it was uh, protective. So, so we, you know, we've got some, some work going on, but it's very crude at the moment. It really it takes a lot of work to generate these individual level studies of exposure and outcomes. Just acknowledging all the people who were involved in this work. It was a lot of people, at the University of Michigan, as well as some people here. Um, and, you know, different departments within Michigan and USGS. And at that, I will uh, say thanks. I know we're still within 1230, which is good, but I'm sorry there's not as much time for questions. But I'm here. Thanks, Jamie. That, that, that was a great talk. And we, we started 10 minutes late, so you did great on time, by the way. So I'm, I'm sure we could we could accommodate more time for Q&A here. So if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask Jamie. Now. Hey, Jamie, great talk. Thank you for uh, taking the time. We really appreciate it. Um, in all these studies, I'm wondering, you know, you, there's so much information you can gather once you actually have somebody to survey. Uh, how how deep into lifestyle choices do you get into with any of these individuals? As I think about things like cancer, you know, there's so many things that can trigger and or um, perhaps uh, mute cancer in, in individuals. And so I'm just, you know, thinking about all the different, obviously smoking is a huge one, but, you know, off the top of my head, I can come up with others some of which may not really move the needle and others which maybe we don't know. So how do you know when to draw the line? And, and, and just in general, what are, what are some of the things, if you maybe could give an example of the things you would, you do leave, you do follow up, get information on and things that you don't uh, with regards to uh, lifestyle? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So the, the first, the first, I think the main point to think of is that any association, so let's take this study of arsenic and bladder cancer. If there is something that is confounding the association, it needs to be, that something needs to be associated with both the exposure and the outcome. And there's numerous data that support this. So in other words, something that would be associated with high levels of arsenic in the drinking water and associated with bladder cancer. Smoking is unlikely to be that. But there's other water contaminants like nitrates 
or like disinfection byproducts, which could be that. Right. So definitely, I mean, we collected data as best we could on nitrates and disinfection byproducts because of that. But that's where you start. When you're doing a study, you're thinking, okay, what are the factors that could be associated with both? Air exposure of interest and air outcome. You also might have things that you're like, well, there are other exposures that might be associated with bladder cancer. They might not confound our association, but they could be other studies. And we have that too. We have occupational history in the auto industry, for example, that was associated with bladder cancer in our study population. But it didn't influence, you know, you adjust for it, it doesn't influence the arsenic bladder cancer association because it's not associated. Um, so that's where we start. Um, and we did look at nitrates and disinfection byproducts as best we could. We couldn't gather historic data on the disinfection byproducts. It, they just didn't have it. It's like they had like 10 years worth of disinfection byproduct data. And it varied a lot um, over time and when the samples were, were collected. But yes, there is potential confounding there. So when we think about it, we think about, well, the nitrates could be in groundwater, right? That's where they're going to be higher. The disinfection byproducts are higher in surface water. So we think that would, disinfection byproducts might bias our results toward the null. Because maybe people who are on surface water are getting higher risk from the disinfection byproducts. So then we're not able to see the higher risk from the arsenic people because they're compared more so against these disinfection byproduct heavy people. So yes, I mean, those are things you definitely have to think about. In terms of lifestyle behaviors, generally anything that you think could confound, you wanna ask about, so associated with both. In some of our studies, we're looking a lot at medications. That's a big one. And maybe if I could just ask one more real quick, I apologize to everybody else, but hopefully we do have time. And that is, um, so I know that in that study and in future studies, you're looking to, to uh, incorporate biomarkers, but I'm wondering, I'm wondering, are studies, to what extent are current epidemiological studies uh, in looking at, instead of gene markers of disease, I guess I'm thinking about like gene markers of, uh, I guess genomics in general, like we know, for example, you know, the BRCA gene, it can lead to susceptibility to breast cancer. Um, how common is it in epidemiological studies these days that people are looking at genome, uh, you know, doing any kind of genome sequencing of individuals to get a sense of vulnerability to particular cancers or other diseases? Yeah, so it's common. Um, in our study, we measured we measured genes from the saliva, we had buccal cells, and we had a gene environment interaction paper. So we did see some increased risk from some genes that were associated with arsenic methylation. Um, so definitely, I mean, there's gene and environment interaction studies that are out there. The challenge is they're generally SNP driven, right? They're one single nucleotide polymorphism that you're looking at. And you know that's not a full picture. In the GWAS stuff, when you do GWAS times environment, it's just very rare that you see those studies happen because there just isn't power. I mean, there isn't good power for gene by gene interaction or gene by gene by gene interaction, much less, much less gene gene environment interaction. It's a major problem with the literature. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thanks, Jamie. Just I have a quick question, if, if there's still time. Um, and so it, that was a pretty impressive arsenic study that you conducted in Michigan, but, but there was definitely a lot of uncertainty or bias in the data that, that we may have collected. So I have a quick question about the arsenic speciation. Did, did, when you did the correlation, did you specifically look at arsenic-3 or like monomethyl arsenic, or did you just combine them as a total arsenic and perform all your correlations in the study? So within the urine, we combine them. So in the urine, we combine the arsenic-3, arsenic-5, and MMA and DMA. Um, in the water, when we were speci speciating, we did look at different amounts of arsenic-3 and arsenic-5. 
as best we could. Um, you know, there's always questions about the redox and how, how stable the different oxidation species are. But, you know, we ran columns. Okay. But um, my, would, would the arsenic speciation, like, you know, would there be some sort of metabolism or transformation that's happening in the human body that the concentration or the, or the species in the urine would be different from what they expo get exposed to? How, how was that then uh, looked into? Yeah, so we were, we're going on the assumption within the urine that arsenic-3, arsenic-5, MMA, and DMA are coming from the more toxic forms. There is some evidence that eating seafood might lead to higher levels of DMA, uh, DMA arsenic, but it's, it's, not, it's not terribly strong that it's going to really drive the concentration of DMA. Um, so in, in general, we, we feel pretty good about it. It's what, it's what is still pretty much done with the urine is to sum up the arsenic, the inorganic, the MMA, and the DMA, and treat those as the toxic forms. And yeah, there are some studies that look at the ratio of MMA to DMA and the ratio of inorganic to MMA. And you can do that as well. All right, great, thank you so much. Um, we did go past 12.30, um, so I think Bruce, do you did anyone else have a question? Last question. I have an open-ended question, Jamie. Thanks for the talk. Is um, you know some some of the things that have changed over my life, and especially over the last generation or so, is um, um, I was just looking at. I don't know if I believe what I just searched. Is the average American drinks about a pint of uh, bottled water a day now, uh, uh, and um, and. And then people that drink tap water, some of them are putting them through various filters. And uh, um, is this got is this challenge easily? You know, how, how well can we? Is it significant enough that where it's complicating your life and the ability to do good analysis now? I would say no, because you can measure those things and. I guess it depends to some extent how historical those behaviors were. In the current residents, you know, like at least when we were doing this in the 2000s, you know, we were fairly comfortable that, you know, most people had lived in their home for 20 some years. If they had, if they drank bottled water, we tested it. You know, we tested the bottled water. We had bottled water that came from a spring in Genesee County that had five and a half micrograms per liter in it. And that was their home drinking water that they used. And we let them know. Um, so current residence was easy and, and is easy in an individual level study, right? You can, you, can, you can measure it. The question is going back in time, whether or not behaviors change over time, to what extent. Um, I wasn't, for this study, I wasn't worried. For current, it would be interesting to know whether or not it is something that is harder to estimate going back in time. Could be. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Jamie. I, I think we've, we've hit the time. Um, really great talk. And, and I hope our, the proposal get funded and you know we do more work here in Long Island. We'll see. It would be great. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Jamie. Bye.